Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be here and um, talk about my favorite subject, Greek animal sacrifice. And we have divided the time, so I will begin and Flint will end. And this paper first, the working title of this one was the final, was not this one, it was, my suggestion was the final truth, animal bones and ancient Greek religion, but Flint kind of calmed me down there, so we <laughs> changed it to truth in the trash. I think that's much better, so thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see. Well, Animal bones lie at the center of ancient Greek religion. According to one of the myths explaining the relation between gods and humans, the Titan Prometheus and Zeus met at Mekone in order to define the status of gods and men. Prometheus killed and slaughtered an ox and divided it into two portions, one consisting of meat wrapped in the hide, which was then hidden in the unattractive stomach, and the other made out of, of the bare white bones covered in the glistening fat. Zeus got to choose which packet he preferred and took the fat covered one, becoming very upset when he discovered that it did not contain anything more than the bare bones. The result of this meeting was that gods and humans henceforth were to be separated and most of all eat differently. Hesiod, who tells the story, ends his account by stating that this division of the ox and Zeus choosing the fat wrapped bones are the reason why men now burn the white bones on their altars. That this story is simply not a story, but closely linked to what the Greeks actually did when they sacrificed to their gods, is evident from how other written sources mention the burning of bones at animal sacrifice and from how frequently this activity is represented in the iconographical record. <clears throat> but most of all, the investigation of at least 15 sanctuaries dating from the end of the Bronze Age well into the Hellenistic period has revealed evidence that the burning of bones was an important part of the worship of the gods for the ancient <coughs> Greeks. This type of sacrifice was designated to Sia and was the main ritual used for communication with the gods. At the Tusia, the animal was shared between gods and humans. The deity would receive certain bone, bones burnt in, burnt in the altar of fire, usually thigh bones and tail sections, and would profit from the sacrifice by inhaling the fragrant smoke. The human party received everything on the animal that could be eaten, meat, innards and blood, as well as the hide. The Tusia always ended with a meal for the worshippers. This presentation will address the use of, use of, let's see, oh, oops, how do I go back? No, sorry, I'm over pressing here. Okay, okay. Um, this presentation will address the use of animal bones as a source for understanding ancient Greek sacrificial practices. You will hear two perspectives, which to a large extent are complementary. Flint Dibble is primarily an osteologist and an archaeologist, while I am a classical archaeologist and ancient historian with an interest in bones. What we will offer is an illustration of the potential of the zooarchaeological evidence for exploring the complexity of animal sacrifice. The bones can complement the ancient texts, inscriptions and images, but also offer a contrast or even contradict our other sources. But bones can also present us with actions and settings which the ancient authors, the political bodies laying out and laying down written norms on stone slabs, or artists decorating pottery or making votive reliefs, um, um, did not, do not provide any trace. We have to remember that both text and images constitute choices of what to include and record and they were never made on the, with the purpose to document or provide information for us future scholars. The zooarchaeological evidence, on the other hand, represents actual actions that took place at a specific location at a specific time and can, in a sense, be said to reflect the ritual reality in a more direct manner. So, animal bones are important, this much is evident. But is this not something that is universally accepted or under and understood? Well, to a certain extent, yes, 
and perhaps Flint and I here are now preaching for already converted. Still, at a conference on ancient Greek cult practice held at the Swedish Institute here at Athens in, in 88, 1988, a scholar's plea of better publication of animal bones as to species, condition, and fine context in order to be more useful for understanding Greek, Greek, Greek ritual practice was met with dismissal as an unnecessary request. Let us not get lost in technicalities was the laconic commentary to the request for a more comprehensive study and publication of the so archaeological evidence. Since then, fortunately, much has happened and the situation has improved. Still, many questions remain. And I will briefly address three issues. One, the role of dogs in Greek religion. Two, the ritual handling of pigs. And three, finds of exotic and unusual animals in Greek sanctuaries. My main point is to explore how the animal bones relate to our other types of ancient sources. Flint will then present two case studies that move beyond the traditional boundaries of zooarchaeology as providing answers to species-focused questions at sanctuaries. First, he will present an assemblage of bones from the Temple of Zeus at Histria in Romania, where the anatomical patterns of taxonomic <coughs> and butchery marks reveal the operations of animal sacrifice, slaughter, and preparation in the sanctuary. Secondly, an analysis of burned bones at the settlement of Azoria on Crete reveals a new sacrificial pattern of burned lower limb and sometimes head bones that has paralyzed in a number of other Greek settlements. Flint will close with a brief uh, quantitative comparison between zooarchaeological and textual records and with some ideas for future research. So, first, dogs. <laughs> Am I going in the right direction? No, I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> the <laughs> end. This is not made for a Swedish woman <laughs> with strong hands. Well, we know everything. Yeah, we know everything. <laughs> yeah. I can just shut up. Thank you. Oh no, why is that happening? Oh, it wasn't only me. <laughs> no, something's up with the clicker. Okay. It's going on. It's running the circ. <coughs> hmm. No, we should stop it. Yeah. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, I can do it. But we should just remove the because it's the battery. Yeah. There goes. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, dogs. Our written sources speak of, speak of dogs being sacrificed to Hecate and Neolios, but also used for purification rituals. A dog cut into halves could be used to purify both humans and a plot of land. It's important to note that these rituals, the animal was destroyed and the meat was not eaten. Puppy meat, on the other hand, is recommended in the Hippocratic corpus as suitable diet for the sick and the weak, as it is easy to digest but there is no indication of these animals being sacrificed and then eaten. Representations of dog rituals are few and hard to interpret. This well-known vase, now in the National Museum here at Athens, shows a woman holding a dog by the tail. The animal looks strangely stiff, almost like beset by rigor, rigor mortis, but this may be an iconographical convention to make the animal more clearly visible. Next slide, please. Compare with these pigs being held in a slightly similar position. To the right of the woman, there are three torches, 
taken to indicate that this is a sacrifice to Hecate, and the dog would then have been deposited intact into a hole in the ground. In the woman's left hand, she holds a sacrificial basket, a canoon, a standard part of the iconography of Tusia's sacrifice where the meat was eaten. So the iconography is not entirely clear here. Next slide, please. A recently published Boeotian red figure Skiphos depicts a small boy dressed in a priestly garb with a knife in his right hand and extending his left hand towards a small dog. The hand is empty but clumsily drawn. He's not holding a piece of meat. The iconography recalls that of a sacrificial scene, although the knife is hardly ever depicted in such, in this, in such representations. And you can compare with the, the vase you saw early, the, the vase down in the right-hand corner where you have um, a yet rare scene of a person actually holding a knife next to an altar. The Boeotian Skiphos with a, with a boy and the dog is this a parody of a sacrifice where a boy replaces the priest and the victim is a dog? Or does the scene represent an actual sacrifice? And in that case, what kind of ritual? From this evidence, we can see that dogs were sacrificed and sometimes eaten for medical purposes. But the text and images are not entirely clear about what's going on. The zooarchaeological evidence provides additional ways of understanding the role of dogs. Next slide. The recently published Agora bone well yielded at least 150 dogs of all ages, which had been deposited whole together with 460 about newborn infants, as well as two larger children and an adult male, all crippled and sick. These animals may have been sacrificed, perhaps to Hecate, to accompany the dead infants, but could also have served as a means for purification. There are no signs of them being eaten. In a cistern in the sanctuary of Poseidon, Calavrea on Poros, on the right part of the slide, more than 30 dogs, adults as well as puppies, were found together with a large number of other animals, including a high number of snakes. These dogs had been butchered and were partly burned and were presumably eaten. Next slide. More evidence for the consumption of dogs <coughs> in sanctuary settings come from the dinner debris from the Air Sacrificiel at Eretria and from the sanctuary of Poseidon at Isthmia, where dog bones were recovered with bones from cattle, sheep, goat, and pigs. These bones derive from the meat-bearing parts, and at Eretria, the cut marks suggest both skinning and division into portions. The unburnt state of these bones and the mixing of dogs with other animals suggest that the dog meat had been prepared by boiling together with the rest of the meat from the other regu more regular animals. The presence of dogs in the leftover of meals in sanctuaries may seem surprising, but can be seen as a strategy to increase the available meat after a sacrifice. These dogs were not sacrificial animals, as dog bones have not been found in the burnt deposits from altars, but rather killed in the sanctuary at home or in the market to procure meat. And we also know from settlement context that dogs were eaten. The ancient Greeks apparently ate the occasional dog, and not only for medical purposes. But this is a culinary practice they chose not to elaborate on in the written record. Next slide. My next example regards pigs. From the epigraphical evidence, it's obvious that pigs were standard sacrificial animals, and sacrificial calendars list them as individual victims or in combination with cattle, sheep, and goats. Piglets could also be used for purifications of people and places and were important in the mysteries at Eleusis. Both the attic votive reliefs and the vase paintings depict fully grown pigs and piglets in sacrificial settings. There is no indication in, in the written and the iconographical evidence that these pigs would not have been sacrificed in the same manner as cattle, sheep, and goats that is, biotisia ritual, at which thigh bones and tails were burned for the gods on the altar. The zooarchaeological evidence complicates this impression. Some years ago, I did <clears throat> a study on the presence of thigh bones and tail sections in the burnt debris from altars in sanctuaries in order to investigate if one part was preferred over the other. Thigh bones turned out to be most frequently <coughs> deriving from sheep and goats, and less so from cattle, while tails predominantly came from cattle. More surprisingly, there were hardly any burnt pig bones in these deposits. 
Added to Sia, the behavior of the side bones and the tails in the fire was a means for procuring signs of the god's acceptance of the sacrifice, the Hiera Kala. Next slide. The tail, when burnt on the altar, would rise and curve as the heat causes the ligaments to contract. The curving tail is shown on many vast paintings and mentioned in literary sources. You see two examples here. And the fabulous cattle tail I owe to Gerhard Forstenpointer of Vienna. <clears throat> Next slide. Modern experiments, foremost by Jake Morton here in Athens, have demonstrated that thigh bones, when wrapped in fat, will emit high and shining flames after around 10 minutes in the fire. And most likely these were taken as a hierakala sign as well. The burning of thigh bones is less frequently represented on the vases. The lack of pigtails in the altar deposits led me to think that pigtails might not be able to curve and rise in the same way as cattle, sheep and goats. Next slide. I therefore conducted some practical experiments which indicated that pigtails curve just as well as sheep and ox tails as you can see here. The zooarchaeological evidence shows that pigs were often eaten in sanctuaries, but the fact that neither tails of pigs nor their thigh bones seem to have been burnt on the altars as part of the god's portions suggests that pigs may have been sacrificed by a different ritual than Tusia. At the sanctuary of Demetri at Cyrene, a deposit of unburnt pig bones may indicate that the meat had been used in a particular manner. Next slide. A sacrifice fo focusing on pig meat is in fact described in the song 14 of the Odyssey, where the pig herder Eumaeus sacrifices a pig in his house, a ritual not including any burning of bones. Instead, he throws uh, some raw and some cooked meat into the hearth, fi the fire on the hearth, and deposits a portion of prepared pig meats, pig's meat to the nymphs and Hermes. The view of pigs being meat more than animals, so to speak, is found in some sacrificial regulations as well, when pig meat was added to the distribution of meat from sacrificial cattle and sheep, or simply mentioned as hyikon, pork, with the weight indicated. One could even pay one's membership in a cultic association by a certain quantity of pig's meat. This may not be surprising, as the main commodity of pigs is meat, contrary to cattle, sheep, and goats, which provide milk and for the latter two, wool. However, pigs may be more problematic. In many cultures in the Eastern Mediterranean, pigs bear negative connotations, often linked to the underworld and the impure pure qualities of the dead and purifications. This association is obvious in the Hittite and Mesopotamian evidence, and most prominently in the pork ban in the Hebrew Bible. The sacrificial practices of the West Semitic cultures of the Levant show notable similarities with Greek sacrificial rituals, burning as a mean for transmitting the offerings to the divine side, and the fact that the deity is not fed by the offerings, but only inhales the fragrant smoke. To what extent the Aegean and the Levantine ritual practice are interrelated I, is a complex question I have addressed elsewhere. Still, the cautious attitude to pigs in the Levant may to some extent have been transferred to the West and influenced what was considered as suitable offerings to be burnt on the altar, but still not the of, the, the affecting the Greek view of pigs as suitable both for sacrifice and consumption. My final example regards what is often termed exotic animals, animals which have turned up in Greek sanctuaries but are not the regular ones. When scholars started paying attention to animal bones in ritual contexts, it was quickly noticed that a tantalizing number of species could be present, apart from the standard cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs. These unusual animals hardly ever occur in the burnt deposits from altars, but are found in the leftovers from meals or as individual bones. Wild animals such as deer were eaten but not sacrificed, so were the occasional horses and dogs, horses and donkeys, as well as dogs, as you saw earlier. But the zooarchaeological evidence from Greece sanctuaries reveal an even wider spectrum of species, including vulture, ostrich, gazelle, bear, wild boar, camel, fox, and wolf. Next slide. From the Horion on Samos, there are fragments of a mandible of a crocodile, not the one you see here, but this is <laughs> part, because the one found, is, there are no pictures of it. 
The example, the crocodile found on the mandible, crocodile mandible from Samos, comes from a very large animal, which when alive must have measured five meters from the snout to the tail. Crocodiles do not live on Samos, and their closest habitat is the river Nile, and you see a Nile crocodile below. The Herion attracted an unusual rich array of Eastern and foremost Egyptian offerings, showing the importance outside the Aegean <coughs> sphere. And bone-wise, apart from the crocodile, the sanctuary also yielded hippopotamus teeth, a horn from a North of Af African gazelle, ostrich, ostrich eggshells, and a complete Maxima clamshell, a mollusk only fine in, f found in the Indo-Pacific region, that not in the Mediterranean. Samian mercenaries were employed in Egypt in the Archaic period, and one of these may have brought the crocodile jaw back to the Aegean, once dedicated in the sanctuary. We can only imagine <coughs> the kind of stories this dedicant must have told about this crocodile and his descendants as well also, perhaps including how he killed the beast with his bare hands. Of course, I'm speculating here. Next slide, please. Claws, poor bones and teeth of bears and lions also occur in sanctuaries. Some are pierced and part of jewelry, while others have probably arrived there as a touch to skins, a practice mentioned in the Greek anthology. Antlers could have been attached to hide as well, or be dedicated as individual memorials of hunts. The sanctuary of Apollo and Artemis at Kalapodi has yielded an astonishing number of bones from wild animals, as you can see here, bear, deer, boar, wolf, and lion. Most of the lion bones come from the prehistoric level but one shoulder blade was found in a geometric archaic uh, layer. More interestingly, this scapula, a rich, meat-rich part, had cut marks and is partially burnt, signs often taken to indicate food preparation. Could this lion have been eaten? We have no evidence of the consumption of lion meat in ancient Greece, as far as I know. Still, the lion shoulder blade from Kalapodi may lead us to consider the most famous lion in ancient Greek, uh, in ancient Greek, Greece, um, in a new light, that is the Nemean lion, from which Heracles took his skin. Next slide. This vase in Munich shows the hero skinning the animal, but Heracles' body position is a bit odd for this task. Next slide. Um, it closely resembles this skifos in Warsaw, which depicts the scene of butchery where a man removes the entrails from a sheep lying on its back on a table, uh, probably the kidneys. Heracles had a notorious appetite. And is it possible that, the, that he is here not only skinning the animal, but also preparing it for dinner? Next slide. The zooarchaeological evidence indicates a much broader spectrum of animals present in Greek sanctuaries than what our other ancient sources let us know. The bones also reveal that the Greeks must have eaten a wider variety of meats than what our written and iconographical sources suggest. Animal bones in sanctuaries do not correspond to the same activities and are present for different reasons. We therefore need to distinguish at least between three kinds of zooarchaeological evidence in Greek sanctuaries. First of all, debris from the animals sacrificed at the altar, which is usually burnt and made up of thigh bones and tail sections. Two, the leftovers from meals, which included both sacrificial animals and animals killed to be eaten either in the sanctuary, at home, or in the market. And three, individual bones dedicated as votives. I'm comfortable there. You're comfortable there? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move down here so I can switch the slides. Um, so I'm going to present in a slightly different way. I'm not going to read a text. So just, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so as a zooarchaeologist, when I'm handed a bone, I'm often asked what species uh, we're looking at. Is it a pig? Is it a dog? And I think there's something that we need to do is we need to recognize that bones can tell us far more than just what species that we're looking at. Um, it, particularly, we can look at the anatomy of animals and how animals are treated in a sense uh, via taphonomy, butchery, and burning, as we've already heard. And so it, it's a slightly different reconceptualization of how we think about bone evidence. After all, we all understand animals, sheep, goat, pig, and cow. But to start thinking about how bones and their various variables can start letting us understand sacrificial practices means we need to expand. 
And so the two case studies I'm going to present will, will specifically do this. And then I'll return to more of a species-focused uh, uh, approach, the type of approach that we're all familiar with when we think about animals. Um, so I'd like to first look at the case study of Histria um, in Romania. It's a colony from Miletus. Um, in the 7th century BC, and uh, there's a sacred area there currently under excavation and study by Julian Brzezescu, who I'm thankful for inviting me to study animal remains, um, specifically from the Temple of Zeus. Um, so when I first arrived, he presented me a really large bag of bones, um, and it was from a late archaic fill deposit um, due to renovations at the temple. And I basically said, look, one bag of bones, there's no way that we're going to be able to say anything interesting from this. I usually need a lot of data. Um, and so I, I was shocked after a week of looking at this bag of bones that I actually had something to say. Um, so when you look at it, obviously the first thing you do is you look at species and uh, about, a little over half of the bones were from sheep. Um, and so the, the, this is a fairly consistent deposit. And I want to make clear that yes, sheep, distinguishing sheep from goat is kind of difficult as a zooarchaeologist. And what I do is I divide the indistinguishable sheep slash goat by the proportion of identifiable sheep and goat that I have, and that's how I produce a, gra a graph like this, or graphs that you see later on. So what's going on with this deposit? Why, it's in a fill layer, but I think there's a lot more that we can say about operations at this sanctuary, just from this one set of bones in this uh, leveling fill. Um, the first thing we can see is that there's almost no thigh bones. There's only one sheep or goat thigh bone from here. And so this tells me that it's probably from sacrificial ritual. Um, most often, thigh bones and tails were burned at the altar, um, the hindquarters, and since these are missing from here, they were probably burned and deposited elsewhere, um, especially in a large bag of bones, a large deposit of bones like this, to only have one securely identifiable thigh bone from sheep or goat. That's very surprising and tells me it's probably from sacrifice. If we look more closely at the condition of the bones, um, we see that this one assemblage is actually two different assemblages. Um, about half of the bones were extremely beach-worn and abraded. So they were at one point deposited on the beach, and the tides, the waves, they rolled them around in the sand and abraded them down to smooth surfaces, smoothed out the edges, and uh, removed most of the surface of the bones. Well, on the other hand, the other half of the assemblage was much better preserved, so it was originally deposited somewhere else, um, and the two were lumped together in this leveling fill. Um, if we start looking at species and the condition that they're in, it's quite clear that the cattle and the pig, uh, the non-sheep slash goat, were predominantly beach-worn. So most of the cattle and pig were deposited by the beach, while a lot of those sheep, what most of the deposit is, was not deposited by the beach. Uh, the temple, by the way, is right next to the, 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 the ancient shoreline. Um, so if we zoom in on the sheep-goat assemblage, most of the anatomy is there. So we have pretty much the full animal represented, except for the thigh bones, of course, that are missing because they were presumably burned on the altar. And if we start to divide these sheep go to bones based on their condition they're in, whether they're beach-worn or not, we see a very clear pattern. The, the beach-worn specimens are those bones that are not meaty. They're the lower legs, they're the heads, they're the parts that you would not eat. And so I would probably interpret this as slaughter refuse. When you slaughter an animal, um, you're not going to take certain parts with you to go eat them, you're going to leave parts behind. And so this is probably slaughter refuse that's ending up on the beach, perhaps because they were actually slaughtered on the beach, sort of like in, uh, in, in the Odyssey. Um, on the other hand, the, the non-beach-worn specimens are predominantly the meaty parts. So this is the meal refuse, or the refuse from uh, preparing a meal. Um, and so both of these patterns are statistically significant, by the way. Um, they correlate very closely with the, uh, pr the relative amount of meat on each of these body parts. Um, and if we look more closely at the, at the butchery operations, we can see that there's two different types. There's cleaver chops that are done by chopping through a bone. And those are predominantly used for carcass preparation. So they're sort of chopping through the vertebra. They're probably stringing up the animal and chopping down through it, um, just as you could see it at the central market downtown today. And then also to remove the, the legs from the carcass. On the other hand, the knives uh, that leave cut marks on bones are being done probably for meal preparation to break down these larger cuts into something that fits in a cook pot or portion sized. And so by looking, at the condition of bones, butchery marks beach, uh, the, the beach wear on the bones, and then distinguishing that based on the anatomy, where they are in the carcass, we can start to put together the entire operation at Histria, 
we can see that they're slaughtering the animal in one place and that refuse is going in one place. And then the, the thigh bones are being burned and that refuse is going in a different place. And then the meals are being prepared and the refuse from the meals are being deposited in yet another place. And during the renovation of the temple, it was the, the slaughter refuse and the meal refuse that was combined together in one deposit. And so it's by looking at these variety of variables that I can start putting together the sort of the fact that sacrifice was taking place in different places within this sanctuary, even though we only have one deposit of bones at this time to look at. Um, at the same time, to push back against what we normally think about as classical Greek zooarchaeology, a lot of it is very temple and sanctuary oriented. The vast majority of sites that have been studied, they come from temple and sanctuaries. And I think this is something we really need to be pushing back against. This gives us a very biased picture of what we have in the archaeological record. And so most of what I've actually studied comes from settlements. And so I'm going to specifically look at the settlement of Azorias on Crete. Um, it's the subject of my current postdoc. Um, this is primarily an archaic period settlement. Um, I'll be looking at the earlier phase, which is from about 725 to 600 BC, and I'll also be looking a little bit at the, at the last phase, at the end of the Archaic period. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the site, because I just recently presented on it, but it's an extremely large site in East Crete. Um, it's been excavated from 2002 to 2006, and then 2013 to 2017. And we just finished our excavations, and I've been busy studying all the bones. And this is a unique opportunity for me, because unlike many projects in historical Greece, we've, uh, it's not only been a large-scale excavation, we've uncovered a variety of the site, but we've been paying attention to organic remains in order to understand food and how it fit into this polis. And so we've done a, a large number of flotation samples, and we've sieved everything to be able to get a very rich sample um, which specifically for me is the animal bones. I've gone through over 200,000 specimens at this point. Um, I've been doing this since 2013, and I should finish hopefully by May. Um, and so with this, I can start talking in more detail about butchery patterns across the site, burning patterns across the site, etc. cetera, um, because a lot of these bones are extremely fragmented. So this kind of detail is not present on most bones. And so when we look at the site itself, we can sort of start to get uh, compare for example, what's going on in households versus what's going on in the communal dining building at the very top. And we can compare what's going on for, for meals at home versus feasts where the community comes together um, to eat animals. And so the first thing that I noticed that's very different is how animals are butchered. And specifically in middens associated with the communal dining period, uh, building, I find that that's where most of my cleaver chopped bones come from. While on the other hand, in the households, there's very, very few cleaver chop bones. It's primarily just knife marks. And if I start plotting out where these cleaver chops are, I can see that these are professional butchers. I map out butcher marks in GIS software, actually, uh, on the anatomy. And they show up in very tight zones at this site, telling me that they're most likely professional butchers associated with these feasting events. And so this tells me that while the animals they're eating are fairly similar at home and in civic feasts, the cuts of meat they're getting are probably very, very different. Um, I like to compare it to the difference between a lamb chop and paidakia here in Greece. They're very different because of band saws versus cleavers that, that, are, that are still used today. Um, and if we look at sort of the condition of berm bones um, at an earlier phase at the site, we have what we think is a temple. We call it the Proto-Archaic Building. And it's in use from 750 to 600 BC. And it has a large hearth room. And just outside of the hearth room is what we've termed a pyre deposit. Um, it's an extremely thick layer of ash and berm bones um, deposited right outside the temple in a corridor. And uh, in this pyre deposit, um, we, we presume it's scrapings from the hearth to clean it out. There's a different assemblage of pottery than we get elsewhere. It's almost all fineware and drinking vessels and pouring vessels, which is very different from throughout the rest of the site. And it's also a large quantity of burn bones, um, the most burn bones I have at the site by far. Um, it's mostly goat followed by sheep, which, which tracks what I have everywhere on the site. Um, and the distribution of burn body parts in this pyre deposit is different from what we normally see in sacrificial rituals. Most of the published sacrificial rituals in Greece, they're the thigh bones and the tails, the hindquarters. Instead, what I have is mainly lower legs. Over 80% of the bones from here come from the lower legs. And so this is something sort of different. There's not many textual references to this pattern. The only one I've been able to find is from the Homeric Hymn to Hermes, where Hermes steals a, a herd of cattle from Apollo, and he walks them backwards to be able to hide his theft, and then he slaughters two of them. And after he's done, he lays out portions for each of the 12 gods, and he cleans up by burning the feet and the heads in the fire. 
And so I think that this is a good textual comp comparandum for this type of sacrificial ritual, which I've been tracking at a number of different sites um, and in different deposits at Azoria as well. So later on in deposits that date to the end of occupation at Azoria, we have five other deposits with this type of ritual, predominantly burned lower limbs, sometimes head bones. Um, these are in much better condition than these pyre deposits. They're largely mostly complete bones, and therefore we think that it has to do with the end uh, at the abandonment of the site. This is probably an abandonment ritual before these people left their homes and destroyed the site. It was intentionally destroyed, we think, by the occupants. They had this last meal, in a sense. And these patterns are very clear. It's always lower legs, and sometimes it's heads. For example, in one deposit in a household, it's only left-sided goat horn cores and right-sided goat metatarsals. So it's very intentionally selected and found in one clear deposit. Um, and oftentimes these are structured deposits. For example, this group, this, when it was excavated, it was a fully articulating cow foot that they found that had been burned. Um, and it was found right next to the hearth. Um, in this other, this is from a masonry bin. I call it the hymn to Hermes in a bin because it's predominantly burned lower legs and heads. And that's basically what's there. And what's really interesting is it's clear that these bones were treated very carefully. Um, for example, you see in the lower right, uh, there's a burned astragalus, an ankle bone, that articulates with a, a fully unburned calcaneus, the heel bone. So they must have carefully disarticulated this astragalus and burned it. And then it ended up deposited together with unburned bones, including one that was from the same ankle of this goat. And so these are very intentional selections for burning that I find at the site, which tells me that this must be a real sacrificial ritual. Earlier scholars of Greek religion had suggested that the hymn to Hermes was an inversion of sacrificial ritual. But I find this archaeologically speaking. And I can trace this pattern from the Late Bronze Age to the Hellenistic period. It's published at Late Hellenic Ios Constantinos in a, in a group of bones that's also found next to a hearth, and it's also published at Late Hellatic Eleusis in Megaron B in a series of small pits with a few burn bones. These are all lower legs of pigs. Um, I've studied a deposit from Halosmenos near Azorias, um, and that's found, uh, again, next to a hearth. And this is the burned lower legs of sheep, and pri primarily sheep and cattle. And uh, again, I think this is probably near the abandonment because these bones are fairly intact, unlike some of the others. Um, at Nicoria, um, I've, I restudied that site. I have a publication coming out soon on it. Um, not on this pit, though. Um, but, uh, but here, the only burned bones at the site from the Late Bronze Age to the Early Iron Age is, are in this one pit. They all are found together, and they're predominantly the burned lower legs of sheep and cattle. These are extremely fragmented and calcined, um, and they're found with a good group of uh, proto-geometric uh, drinking vessels, fineware. And then if you look at the data that's been published from Comos, you can see near Altar U, while most of the bones are burned thigh bones, the typical Theseus sacrifice of uh, sheep and goat, there's a group of burned cattle feet bones that comes about, about 80% of the cow bones, or maybe I'm getting that wrong, maybe it's 65% of the cattle bones from this deposit derived from lower legs, and most of them are metapodials. Um, and then finally, here in Athens, in the Athenian Agora, just recently published by, uh, by Susan Rotroff, the, the, the majority of the burn bones in Hellenistic pyre deposits are also lower leg, lower limb uh, animals and feet. And so this is a pattern that does exist in ancient Greece um, from the late Hellenic through the Hellenistic period. And I see this as sort of something that's very different from our typical thesia, this very typical sort of burned thigh bone. And I see there being two predominant patterns of burned sacrifice that we find in the archaeological record. And so I'm going to share a couple preliminary thoughts I have on it. I'm, I think we need a little more data to be sure, but I have a few ideas about how these two could maybe be contrasted with one another and compared. And in fact, I had an idea tonight, Gunal, um, if, if you think about uh, the difference in s the scale of sacrificial intensity. And Gunnel first suggested this idea when comparing, for example, a Theseus sacrifice to a Holocaust, where we don't find Holocaust rituals where the whole animal is burned very often in the archaeological record. It's a very exceptional thing. There's only two, I think, that have been published um, from Isthmia and uh, Thassos. On the other hand, we find these Theseia uh, the burning of thighs and tails at a number of temples and sanctuaries. And so if we contrast these two, maybe Holocaust is only done if, if during very special events because it's a more intense ritual. You don't get any food from it. But what I'm thinking is maybe we can expand this idea of sacrificial intensity into a larger scale 
where at the, there's a low end where there's no burn bones, sort of what we see with pigs, for example, um, or what we might see at the, in the communal dining building at Azoria, where we don't have many burn bones, but it's clearly the community coming together to feast and was probably conceptualized as a sacrifice. And then further up, slightly more impressive, is when the lower limbs are burned. These are a more inferior cut of meat, of course. And then, of course, you have the, the Theseus sacrifice, which is a more superior cut. While the, the meat itself is not being sacrificed, the thigh bones and the tails represent this more superior cut of meat. And then finally, of course, there's the, the Holocaust, which is where you burn the entire animal, and it's a much larger spectacle, and there's no meat for anybody, only for the gods. Another perhaps way to contrast these two, which might fit into this idea, is the difference in fine context. So most of the burned thesia, these thigh bones and tails, they come from public context. They come from temples, altars, sanctuaries. Um, it, while on the other hand, the majority of context where this lower leg, sometimes head bones come from, is, is from private context, from households, um, from smaller structures. And so maybe this is a distinguishment between sort of large scale civic events, cultic events versus what you do at home. Um, and then the third idea I have is maybe this is a chronological pattern. In the late Bronze Age, we have a variety of different bones that are burned. For example, we have at Pelos, they select the mandible, the humerus, and the femur of cattle and deer that we find in the archives room and at a series of different deposits. At Eleusis, Mathana, and Halosmenos, we have lower limbs. And then at Lycaon and Calipodi, we have the typical thighs and tails. In the early Iron Age and early Archaic period, it's now down to primarily our two common types. Temples and altars are dominated by thighs and tails, but there's a couple with these lower leg sort of sacrifice at Azoria and Comos at least. And then in private context, there's this lower leg sacrifice. And then finally, by the late Archaic and the Hellenistic period, things become a little more orthodox in terms of how things are done. So in temple and sanctuary context, all we see is thighs and tails. And so there's this new orthodoxy that, that's been established, and this is the appropriate way to burn bones perhaps on an altar. But on the other hand, as we see at Azoria and in Athens, the lower limbs are still sometimes burned in the houses. And so maybe they're, they're, there's, it's not as orthodox of a thing to do in the household. And so I don't know, want to think that these three ideas are mutually exclusive. I think they might all fit together, or maybe there's some other new ideas that you all have. Um, but it's some of my ideas, my preliminary thoughts on the, dis, the difference between what these two rituals could mean. And so to close down, I really want to emphasize that I sometimes see this as being the truth in the trash. Um, it, for those of you that know about the archaeology of trash, Bill Rathje did a survey in Tucson where he went around and he surveyed people, what they were throwing out, and then he would actually go through their trash bins and see the difference between what they say they're throwing out and what's actually in their trash bins. And the difference was huge. People underestimated, for example, how much alcohol they would drink or how much pornography they would watch. And on the other hand, they would overemphasize the healthy foods that they would eat. And so, you know, what you actually do is represented by the refuse you leave behind and not how you represent yourself on Facebook. So as an example, what I've been doing is I've been uh, collating references to animals in textual sources, specifically using a big data approach by looking at the thesaurus linguae graeci. And I count animal terms by species and uh, sort of how many different times anim different animals are, re are mentioned in different authors. And I specifically focus on from Homer through the Hellenistic period and only on complete texts. Um, so when we look at counting animals in texts, we see that cattle are the most common. Sorry, I'm gonna show a couple of these graphs. Yellow is always cow, blue is always pig, light green is always sheep, and dark green is always goat, okay? And it goes from 0% to 100%. And cattle are almost always the most common uh, animal that is mentioned in ancient Greek literature. And this is surprising because this is not at all what we see in the trash. If we compare animal bones at different sites, what we see is each settlement each has a different animal that's most common. In some cases it's goat, in some cases it's pig, in some cases it's sheep, a okay, every now and then it's cattle. Um, but it's a variety of different animals are the most common at different settlements. And we see this in the early Iron Age. We also see this at the in the Archaic through Hellenistic period at different settlements, um, where different animals are preferred in different settlements. And same thing is true, of course, at sanctuaries. The variety of sanctuaries that have been published, 
we see each of them are dominated by a different set of animals. And we do have a good sense that this relates to the deity in question, but at the same time it shows there's a, a wide diversity that, that exists in the archaeological record that is not really showing up in our literary sources. And so if you look, for example, at Jeremy McInerney's recent book, Cattle of the Sun, he talks about this cattle idiom that exists in Greek culture, and that's very true. This is how people represent themselves. They represent, especially the elites that are writing these texts, and the elites that are consuming these texts, they represent themselves as this kind of cattle culture. Because, and I have this idea that it's probably due to the fact that cattle are, are a symbol of eliteness, of wealth, and therefore they're, they're, they're writing this kind of thing down. And the same is true if we start looking at art. So for example, animals on attic vases, this comes from data published by Folkert Van Stratton. Cattle outnumber other animals uh, by a large uh, uh, proportion. Um, on attic vases. And so this again has to do with how people represent themselves. But if we start going to uh, documentary sources, such as the attic sacrificial calendars, this is not true. These attic sacrificial calendars probably represent actual praxis, um, as one would expect. They're recording what they eat at any given time, and these are predominantly dominated by sheep. Um, and finally, I want to end that I think we, we need to start moving about comparing the literary, the, the textual sources with the zooarchaeological record beyond just species. And I think we have the ability to do that if we look at seasonality. Um, I've gone and counted sacrifices in different months, different attic months in the attic sacrificial calendars, and the majority of sacrifices happen at harvest time in the spring and in the autumn. With, a, with an interesting spike in the middle dead of winter in Gamelion, that's this right in the middle. Um, and so I think this is something we, in the future we can hopefully relate to our evidence from animal bones, specifically by doing biomolecular tests on, on animal teeth. We can actually get a sense of seasonality of where animals are in the landscape, what they're eating, and when they're slaughtered, that we should be able to compare to all this, this rich data set that we have for seasonality in uh, the, the epigraphic record. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming, and in particular, I want to thank you all for the invitation to speak, and Gunal for asking me to join her. And uh, I, I should definitely thank everybody from the Azoria Project, and from Histria as well, because uh, it's been an honor to study the material, and from the Wiener Lab in Athens. So thank you very much, and I'm sure Gunal thanks you too.